chapter four now, which is rock mechanics. And this is a basic introduction to rock mechanics. And what I'm going to talk about again are the things that I uh, didn't feel were covered very well in my own education. Now, uh, when I went to Berkeley, we had rock mechanics courses in five different departments. I think that was something of a record. We had Neville Cook there at the time, and and um, uh, Mike Hood, and Dick Goodman, and Tor Brecky, and all these different rock mechanics people, seeing it from the petroleum end, from the mining engineering end, from a mechanics, uh, solid mechanics end, and rock mechanics from a civil engineering perspective, which of course is my perspective. And so, um, wow, uh, it, there's a lot of uh, a tremendous amount of uh, engineering judgment that is involved in rock mechanics. And so uh, rocks are highly orthotropic. They have different properties in all three axes, uh, very different uh, between perpendicular to the bedding and parallel to the bedding or parallel to the foliation. Um, and so some sedimentary rocks we can treat as transversely anisotropic, which means we assume in the bedding plane, say this, this is the bed here, you can assume that they're equal in either direction uh, if it's lithified. Now, when I was working down in uh, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina and I was drilling holes in very recently deposited, unconsolidated sediments, uh, that was not true. There was a definite uh, fabric to the material parallel to the line of the spring line of the deposition. So if you're looking down the old axis of Bayou Benvenue, you had very high conductivity parallel to that channel, and it was noticeably less off in either direction, perpendicular to that. Uh, so that was not transversely anisotropic. And then vertically, it was an order of magnitude or greater uh, difference because all the dead organics lay down flat over one another. So when you drill a vertical hole, punching through those horizons and then pour water in it, that's not a realistic representation of what's going on in the natural system. By drilling the hole, you're punching through all of those flat leaves that keep the water from moving as fast vertically as it does horizontally. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you do a permeability test. It's under constant head, it's under very small head. One to two PSI is nothing. When you start getting a dam 700 plus feet high and you put uh, 700 feet ahead through a hairline crack, you can get a whole bunch of water because water pressure is uh, maybe 350 PSI, not one PSI. So you can get, when you talk about the intrinsic permeability of something, it doesn't mean much unless you take it in the context of head. So when we put in a grout curtain, like for something like Hales Bar Dam on the uh, Tennessee River, and we got these underground caverns along a couple of faults that run up and down the channel, you got miles and miles of head through those flooded caverns coming up to the dam, you got this little itty bitty grout curtain going by and the water pressure is going down underneath that grout curtain and coming up. And it's pretty darn high. It's a lot higher than people realize. If you really sit down and draw these things to scale and put the loading diagrams on them, which I call a free body diagram, that's where we use our engineering side of our head, uh, these things will become patently obvious to you. And that's why a lot of times I'm in these different dam safety panels. I have to draw these kinds of drawings for people that are in the panel to show them that you know, a lot of engineers get used to drawing water pressure against a wall, and then they stop it at the bottom of the wall. And they, they actually think that the water pressure stops at the bottom of the wall. No. The water pressure keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you go down on the ground. Now, if it starts leaking, that curve, that, that uh, envelope is going to start coming around like this because you got water leaking through. So it doesn't take a very big crack to leak a lot of water under the curtain, grout curtain of a dam at high pressure head, especially if you get something that's 300 feet or, or higher. And that's what happened to the Louisville district over at Wolf Creek Dam. They put in a big cutoff curtain back in the late 70s 
And the panel said at the time, you know, if you don't take this thing all the way out and around the corner, you'll be back. Just like Arnold Schwarzenegger says in his movie, I'll be back. And sure enough, 30 years later, they're back. And now they're doing something that's, you know, two, three orders of magnitude bigger because they chose to save money back in the late 70s. Okay, so get a pencil. Here's the problems I want you to do for Chapter 4. They're on pages 119 to 121. And I want you to do the following problems. Numbers 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10. 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10. Okay. Now, in addition to that, we're going to be doing some professional development work. Uh, and that, let me get on to uh, Blackboard here and look what that's going to be. Um, let's see. They told me last time how to get on Blackboard. What do I do? Is it favorites? No. Current students. Current students. Oh, just put your mouse over current students. Actually, Blackboard's over to the right now. All right there. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's see if we can get in on this. Okay, under course documents. Uh, why isn't it? Oh. All right. There is a thing here called engineering and geology registration. I'd like, oh, folder empty. Wow. Uh, well, hmm. All right, I'll have to repair that. I don't know what happened to it. It's not in there. All right, schedule of charges and terms. I want you to do that this week. That's a follow-up to uh, the writing assignment we just had. Hmm. I don't know what's going on here. What happened? Nice documents. Huh. Are these things not in there? Click on up here? Where it says to help protect right. your security. I don't know. Someone's got to come up here and show me. I can't hear the guy back there. So, sorry. Download file. Okay. Thank you. Wow. All right. This is uh, this is like 12 years ago. So this is a schedule, a typical um, schedule of charges and terms. Um, for the distance learners, they're sending me much more uh, thorough ones from the companies they work for right now. But this is typically what's attached to the back of the proposal. And the client is supposed to review it and sign it and acknowledge that they have seen it. And then I also want you to uh, download um, the uh, – huh, I don't see it here. The typical uh, limitations of liability clauses, that's in the, the upper, the first document that's on there. So, oh gosh, what did I do? Hmm. Huh. So under course documents, the first document should say limitation of liability clauses. Now, do I hit that? 
Yeah. And then I have to hit something up here. Yeah. yeah. Download file. Okay, now what I did here is I just assembled the clauses that I used in different kinds of um, jobs. Now, you're not going to use all of these ever in one. You have to click it, the flashing thing. Right here? Yep, just click it. That's schedule. It. Okay. So standard limitation of liability clauses. These come from the Association of Soil and Foundation Engineers, ASFE. Uh, now called just ASFE, the greatest people on earth. That's the trade organization for the geotechnical and geoenvironmental industry. And these are the kinds of clauses that you would use throughout the body of your reports when you're describing things, like uh, long-term variability with groundwater conditions. If you did encounter groundwater, you'd want to put some sort of statement in there saying, you know, we encountered groundwater in these borings at these levels, but those are subject to change. You know, depending on what time of year, type of boring you put in, how long you monitor it, uh, changes next year, the year after, when the job actually uh, gets done. And so if you don't encounter groundwater, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be groundwater there, and so on and so forth. So I want you to print this out and just look at it because you're going to be referring to this. It's going to be a cheat sheet that you're going to refer to constantly in your career. Now here's the danger of doing boilerplate. <laughs> boilerplate, there's a danger in that you'll always copy everything in the boilerplate. So every time we were reviewing paper, we were reviewing reports that different companies did, we would see things that got left in there from the boilerplate that didn't belong there. That's not good for your career. It's not good for the company. It's not good for your reputation. And other times, they had inappropriate limitation of liability statements and things like this in there that don't belong in there. So don't go overboard on these things, but look at all these different possibilities. I've got pages and pages and pages of possibilities, like on laboratory testing and sub-drainage and things. And these are, these are only going to be in certain kinds of reports. So then you look on my website and you look at the different proposals and you'll see some of these in each proposal and they're all different. And then if you look down below that in the, in the reports, you're going to see that I use some of these clauses, different ones in various reports. So you, you only use the clauses that go with what's in that report. And so what you're doing here is you're covering yourself and you're saying, uh, we always want to say in our business, that you always reserve the right to change your mind if shown new information that is credible. So uh, you never want to say, you know, this is it and it's never going to change because we know, as you saw in the cross-section exercise last week, that your ability to guess ahead of time is what? Not that great. Yeah, it's not that great. And those, those guys in Budapest, you know, they were professionals. They did a nice cross-section. They, they knew the geology of the area. And they missed it by a country mile. And so you want to realize that uh, you can be sued uh, very easily for mischaracterizing a site. And so you want to put enough language in there uh, to say, you know, here's the probability of these things and realize that uh, we're basing it on all these different things and uh, it's subject to change and it's subject to confirmation when we get out into the field. So where all the big problems occur in our business is where we don't get called by the client to go out and verify the conditions at the time of construction. If we don't get to go out there, you better write a, a letter real fast that says our report was conditional upon going out and reviewing the site. We hear that the client has hired such and such construction company and is grading the site and not calling us. That's what happened on the subdivision I live in over here in Rolla, and it's got all kinds of problems because the builder didn't see why he should have to call the civil engineer to come out and check the grade stakes. A well, contractor knows how to read grade stakes. He's just trying to make money for himself. So what do we have? We have a street that doesn't drain to the creek. It stops 30 feet short and deposits all the water and all the silt all over the street. So it's always muddy, always messy, and always looks crappy. But we save some money. And we haven't fixed it yet because it's going to cost us about $70,000 to fix it after the fact. That is so typical. 
That's so typical. And that's the kind of client you don't want to work for. Now, why did the client feel that way? It was the first subdivision he'd ever done. He'd always just built houses before that. And he didn't realize, no, there's a reason for coming out there and checking the grade stakes. You think MoDOT lets a contract and never comes out and watches them build it? Guess again. Come on. You have to have somebody out there watching to make sure it's actually going like it's supposed to. And you need someone there to say, oops, this isn't going to work right here. We're going to have to make a field modification. We're going to have to change something to make this work. But generally, water is the one predictable thing. It flows downhill most of the time. And you better know where the hills are, where the low points are, and the high points are. So read this. Um, and then do the assignment on um, limit on that I have there for you. Uh, um, the assignment on schedule of charges and terms. That's not very very hard to do, but you need it for um, assignment number two, which we're going to have uh, next week. And we're also going to be logging a um, writing assignment number two is what you'd be using that for, and that's uh, questions on schedule of charges and terms. So if we go back to assignments, let's see if I think this is how we do this. Nope, it's messed up again. I sure, I'm sure, I apologize, I don't know how to navigate on this thing very well. They changed it over this year, and I just learned last year how to use that one. So, uh, course assignments. Look at assignment number two. It's writing assignment number two. Questions on schedule of charges and terms. It shouldn't be too awfully hard. So I do that. Oh, no. I do this. Download file. Open. Huh. Is it down here? There we are. Okay, schedule of charges and terms. I'm just going to ask you some basic questions here. What are the two kinds of agreements between consultant and client? This kind of stuff, the reason I do this, you think, well, geez, this is getting into a lot of uh, work-related stuff. Yeah, it is, because this is the kind of stuff that's going to impress the person that interviews you when you uh, go to career day and you show them example reports, example proposals, and you know what these terms mean. You need to know what LOL, limitation of liability clauses are, and what are um, what kinds of agreements that you enter into. And you also need to realize that um, we don't inspect contractors' work. Inspection conveys that we're uh, giving some sort of seal of approval to it. We observe their work and comment on their work. We don't inspect. We don't use the word inspection. That has legal connotations. So those are the kind of things I want you to know because they're very, very important. And uh, you know, how long do we store the samples for? You know, is that's a company policy at all the different firms and you need to be aware of that. And then um, how, how fast does it take to get um, paid? Uh, why, I had a guy last week given a talk on a dam site, and he was telling these, and we had a lot of students in the audience, and he's saying, well, we couldn't drill over here on this side of the dam because they had power lines. But he never told the students why. The students thought, you know, they might hit the power line. No, these are 70 kV and up. These are big, big, big power lines. And the reason you don't put a drill mast up under a power line is you can get an arc going between the power line and the drill mass, because the drill mass is sitting up there at steel, sitting up there all by itself. And if you get a low pressure day and you get a lot of um, cloudy, rainy kind of weather, all of a sudden you'll get an arc going from that line down and it'll kill all the people around the drill rig and on the drill rig. And that's happened enough times. So drillers are prohibited from drilling underneath high tension lines by their own insurance carriers. But he never said that. And so you got all these kids in there kind of going, why, 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 why is that? Why can't they drill there? Lines are up 70 feet in the air. You know, what's the big deal? 
So and I, I'm, not, not, I'm not sure that the speaker knew that either. He might not have understood that. He's a young guy himself. So that's the kind of stuff. You know, you always want to be asking questions. And some of you have been sending me a lot of good questions. Some of you I haven't heard from, you know. And, but if I get the questions as a boss, I know, hey, this person's working on it. They're thinking about it. You know, that's a good sign. It's when I don't hear anything from you, it's a bad sign. You know, so don't be shy about asking questions. Nothing wrong with asking questions. There's no dumb questions. There's only people too proud to ask. Okay, so we're going to go into chapter five now, or chapter four, rock mechanics. And I'm going to tell you the things I want you to know about rock mechanics that are only based on my own particular pedigree of experience. That doesn't mean this is all you need to know about rock mechanics. Goodness, uh, uh, Norbert Mares is a rock mechanics guy, you know, so he knows a lot more about rock mechanics per se than I do. But I'm just going to give you kind of the glazing overview of what I learned working on the periphery of rock mechanics as a practicing civil geotechnical engineer. So. Here we go. And stop me and ask questions if you have any questions. Okay? So we're going to have a brief overview about the geotechnical applications of rock mechanics as I practiced it. Huh. We're probably still loading here because it's a very large file, 135 megabytes. That may be. Otherwise, I can't figure out why it's not going. There we go. Okay. So rock has been around a long, long time. We're at Hemiji Castle here, which is a World Heritage Site in Hemiji, uh, Japan. And uh, these are rocks, blocks of uh, basalt that have been dimensioned and stacked up to create a battlement. And battlements uh, go back to 6000 BC. The oldest dated one that I know of is at Jericho. Uh, right, uh, not too far from the Jordan River between um, Jordan and the Palestinian Authority. And uh, those types of structures were typically military structures, and that's what we had all through time. We had lots and lots of unreinforced masonry rock structures, and the first time we get civil engineering is as an offshoot of military engineering in France in the early 1600s. So you start seeing the Renaissance, 1500s, you start seeing them, uh, well actually it was in the early 1300s in France, they started building bridges over the rivers like the Romans did, but all the Roman engineering work was done by military engineers and we don't see the term civil engineer till around the early 1600s. It's all military engineers. So if we look at Dimension Stone, here we are actually uh, looking at Nimrod's Castle, which is uh, in the south end of Mount Hermon, overlooking the Golan Heights. Uh, this was built in 12th century AD. And you can see here by this time, they're doing everything with these beautiful curves, and they have this glacis uh, uh, ramp here, nice and smooth, and that's uh, to resist. Uh, sappers and military engineers coming in here and digging under it and knocking off the sharp corners uh, using induced tension. So that's why they went to all these nice curvatures. Saladin, the, the Kurd, who was a great military tactician as well as a military engineer, Solomon uh, came in and would start tunneling under these things with a thing called a turtle. You would actually have this protective cover. These guys would be raining all kinds of stuff down on them, including hot olive oil. But they'd be protected under the turtle, and they'd dig. And they figured out the way to uh, fracture rock was to get it hot and then quench it break it in an or to get a sharp corner and hit it with something hard, breaking it in induced tension. So rock and concrete are weak in induced tension. They're very, very strong in pure compression. So that's their, their strong point. So if we look around the world, there's all sorts of common applications of dimension stone. If you go with us down to Machu Picchu, that's where this picture is taken. And this is actually an unreinforced masonry wall that's actually settled because it's built on a landslide. So there's some local bearing problems and the wall is dilated and moved apart. It's lost a lot of its structural integrity but it's still working quite nicely. Here's, here's a, um, a masonry wall on Tioga Pass Highway coming in the backside of Yosemite National Park built in 1964. Here's one in Italy 
Uh, these are gravity retaining walls. They've been around a long, long time. They're very resilient and they resist freeze thaw a lot better than concrete does actually. So um, Nimrod's castle, I said, was built in the 12th century using basalt blocks and limestone. This is what it originally kind of looked like. And then um, oftentimes we had these earthen tells and the idea of the tell, this was old rubble from the city that were here prior to the fortifications that were built on top of them. And again, this made it more difficult to get up here and attack and try to dig under the foundation and get in. So we call these things citadels. And uh, these earthen mounds were called tells. So that's where the term Tel Aviv comes from. That's uh, the tell. And the one that I think has the most generations of civilization is Tel Hetzor, which is at the south end of the Hula Valley, which is where the three tributaries of the Jordan River come together. And that one actually has 16 different civilizations that have occupied that site. Now, where are the tells? They're always geologically controlled. The geology controls everything. Controls where St. Louis is, controls where Kansas City is, intersections of major rivers. These tells are always over natural springs, and the springs are usually controlled by faults, faults in structural geology. So they have some water source here that goes down into the ground, and they can hold, withhold um, during a long siege. So low porosity crystalline rocks were typically the most favorable by military engineers for um, harvesting dimension stone and you like to have things that are regularly jointed whether it's limestone or granite so you can take these massive rocks out and you can uh, uh, trim them and then use them uh, to build things that are going to be resilient. Now, limestone's always going to be, of course, has a hardness of three, so it's much, much uh, softer. Everybody wants to use granite because it is much more resilient, but it's much, much harder to excavate. Now, here's a Cyclopean masonry wall on a job I had down in Peru many, many years ago. I was in graduate school, and this is a, a, a road leading to a mine with a big switchback right here, and you can see all of this is uh, unreinforced cyclopean masonry. And right here we have a tunnel. And this tunnel is actually for, it's for the river. Because they had this, hair, this big hairpin turn coming out into the river. So they built this tunnel for the river to pass through because they get very high floods from landslide dams being breached up canyon. So they dug a tunnel in order to allow the river a spillway of sorts to go by. And you can see here the size of the rocks in that channel. A lot of these rocks are the size of McNutt Hall. These are just enormous. They're a lot bigger than you think they are. Because this is a, a full-blown two-lane highway here. That block is about 75 feet across right there. That's a, that's a big hunk of rock. All right. Well. Back in 1963, Professor Don Deere was an engineering geologist at the <coughs> University of Illinois in their civil engineering department. He came up with the idea of rock quality designation index, or what we call the RQD. And that was for a job with the Air Force when they were starting to build Cheyenne Mountain uh, for NORAD, North American Air Defense Command, and then starting to do all these um, silos for intercontinental ballistic missiles. And they wanted to have some way of going in and looking at the rock mass and getting an idea how difficult the excavation was going to be and how difficult support was going to be. They're going to have to have temporary support. And so he um, came up with this thing, and it, it was very, very uh, arbitrary. He basically said, okay, we get these boxes of core. Typically, we have NX size core, which is about 2.7 inches. Uh, 2.4, 2.7 in there, and he says, uh, okay, um, the zones that are more broken up are typically going to have smaller pieces or even no pieces. Now, if it has no recovery, you know it was pretty poor material. It came apart in the drill fluid and it got taken out in the drill fluid as cuttings, and so the first thing you do is you have to minus the material that isn't there. Now, that sounds trivial, and I want to clue you about something. It's not. 
I'll give you an RQD um, exercise next week. We're going to put the core in 265 McNutt, and you're going to log it and give me, tell me what the RQD is, and a lot of you are going to miss it right off the top by not minusing out what's missing. Now, what does that mean? That means when you drill a hole or you take a sample round, one of the fundamental things you have to do is measure exactly how much sample you drove in, either by drive sampling, bang, bang, bang. And did you get 18 inches or did you drive it for 19? Most time drillers will drive at 19 because they know when they do a drive sample, they're densifying the soil, especially in the upper two meters. So you get a bad number. That's a disturbed sample. Any kind of drive sample is a disturbed number. But you always want to measure how much they pounded it into the ground and then stop, open it up, and measure how much you get. Now, if he pounds it, 19, I look inside, I got 17.4. Oh, what's 19 minus 17.4? Not so fast. 1.6, very good. Obviously, you're a Phelps County community college student. That's right. You get 1.6 that was lost. Now, that could either be voids or it could be densification of the sample. You don't know which. You know, if you're not, you got to look at it and kind of get a feeling for that because we do have gopher holes and root holes and there's other, there's voids out there. So you always want to be measuring when you do a core run, which is typically a core run in a box like this is 10 feet. So two, four, six, eight, ten five cycle. That's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a 10 foot section of core. They typically have a core barrel that's 10 feet long. Now how often is the driller going to run exactly 10.00 feet? Anybody know? Never. You can't ever do that. He's never going to get 10.00. He's always going to be 9.7, 10.2. You know, it's going to be something close. But you need to know what that number is because it goes to do the RQD. You want to know how much missing material is there from the start. So when you get an RQD of 100, that means 100% of the sample is bigger than pieces four inches long and you had full recovery. Now, can you get that? Sure. Drilling through granite, drilling through massive dolomite. Yeah, you, you can get RQDs of 100. That's not that hard. Um, but you have to minus out the missing material first. Then you start measuring pieces. And the pieces that are under four inches long you discount. Now, you also have pieces, if we look here, you might have pieces where instead of the joints cutting across, the joints going down the sample. If you're drilling right down where there's a joint, that doesn't count. We're talking about pieces that are transverse to the axis of the core. And this becomes a bigger issue when you start doing pilot holes for tunnels and you're drilling horizontally or near horizontally. So we're not talking about natural you know, joints. Uh, the joint goes right down the line of the core, then you don't discount it and say, well, it's less. You look at the length. If it's more than four inches long, then it, it doesn't count against the sample. The pieces that are less than four inches long get subtracted. So I just look at this box right here, and I can tell you right now, RQD on that box, mm, 77 to 81, 85, somewhere in there. That's what it is. Pretty good stuff just by looking at it. RQD over here depends on whether this is where he stopped, but this one is a lot lower. <laughs> They're going to be lucky to get 50 on that one. Okay, so you can see here that on the log, we'll have a running graphic log of RQD, hard, soft, hard, soft, hard, soft, and we'll also have a graphic log that we put in here, and of course today we do this with photographs. We actually take photographs and then inlay them right on the drill log so you can see what it looks like. And you do have to be careful that you take it at natural water content because the color will change as the samples dry out. So typically you shoot it, uh, the picture, within 15 minutes of taking it out of the core barrel. So RQD is the sum of all the pieces that are greater than four inches long this is after you've minused out what's missing, times 100 divided by the total length cord. So here, you're summing everything that you recovered that's more than four inches long, and if you got a number over 75, then you've got pretty good stuff. You've got good to excellent material. Below 75, 
you're in the fair, the poor, and the very poor. Now you get into shales, it's real typical, you'll get less than 25. A lot of times when you're coring through shale, you get nothing <laughs> that's over four inches. And so you have an RQD of zero. Uh, rock mass rating, or the geomechanics classification, was introduced by a South African mining engineer, professor, Dick Biniowski, 1972-73, when he was teaching at Penn State University. It's a pretty simple uh, system to use. It's been defined uh, over the years. Uh, Norbert Mayers, if you take his course, he'll take you out here to some local outcrops along I-44 service road, and he'll show you how to do it. Now, I, I have posted on this RQD, I've posted the original article on your Blackboard site that Don wrote, and then I posted a article that he and his son Don Jr. did 25 years later, and that's the one you want to read. So you got to read the first one to see what the theory was, and then same guys 25 years later saying, hey, here's what we've learned in the practice of doing it. So rock, uh, from a legal point of view, is a very subjective term. And that's, uh, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is rock versus hard rock versus soft rock? Now, wh why would I be so concerned about that? Because of contractual definitions. Uh, you set forth a number in your contract. You say, oh, I can, uh, ex if I can rip it with my cat, Caterpillar D9L single ripper blade, uh, I'm going to call it just uh, medium rock or soft rock. If I can't rip it, then it's hard rock and I have to do blasting or some kind of other mechanical system that's uh, going to be a lot more expensive and a lot more involved. So hard rock things are joint and discontinuity controlled, even granite. Hardest rock out there is going to have joints and other discontinuities. It depends on the types of the joints, their geometry, their intensity is the spacing between them, their aperture. The aperture is how wavy they are between the joints, how much roughness. And then the infilling within the aperture, do they have clay filled infillings? That makes for a lot lower friction. And so their morphology of hard rock slopes is controlled by block kinematics, pure rock mechanics. Uh, okay, well that's simple enough, it sounds pretty simple. Now, what if you get soft rocks? All the California, Oregon, Washington coast is highly tectonized. That's a big structural geology term for it's had the, sh it's just been sheared like crazy. So you don't have rocks with the kind of hardness you see under St. Louis. They don't exist in California. Even Yosemite granite's more chewed up than the stuff you see underneath St. Louis. This is a nice, quiet part of the continental craton here. Things aren't nearly as fractured and beat up. And so here, in softer rock materials, hydrology and hydraulics control the shape of the slope, the slope morphology. Things like the position of the water table, the water effects on shear strength, affects slope stability, regolith development, that's the, what's happening in the weathered zone. Around here, the weathered zone, can be anywhere from 40 to 300 feet down because we're on the oldest erosional surface in North America here in the Ozarks. So chemical environment, the hydraulic conductivity, cyclic hydration, water up and down, and plasticity and hydrodynamic theory ends up controlling the shapes of things. That's why around here you see these really mollified, rounded, low hills because they've been under subaerial erosion for so long block kinematics isn't playing a real big role in them. But you go out and make a highway cut, you just went from over here, over to here. So the highway cuts along Route US 63 are all block kinematic controlled. And some of them are suffering grievously because they're old sinkhole structures. All right, so even the hardest rocks are perturbed by discontinuities. So when I became an engineering geologist, there was this, you know, was this big, huge awakening. Now, when I was a pure geologist, I looked at mineralogy. We call that petrology. So we look at little thin sections, and we look at all the little mineralogical constituents, and how do those little guys get in there, and why are these families together, and we did ternary diagrams, and very much oriented towards economic geology. But when I became an engineering geologist, that all stopped. Engineering geologists aren't so concerned 
about petrology and mineralogy as they are about discontinuities. And they train you, you know, the engineer needs to know about the discontinuities and he needs to know how strong the rock is. He doesn't care what the rock's made out of. The rock could be made out of, uh, you know, dog dew. It doesn't matter. What we want to know is how's it going to behave? Am I going to be able to excavate it? Am I going to be able to disaggregate it, break it up? Am I going to be able to classify it and then make mixtures and then put it in, make fills, use it as a building material? So I'm looking at it from a building materials perspective, and the most important thing are discontinuities. And discontinuities, like marriages, come in all sizes and types. There's little ones, and there's big ones. And there's big faults, the F word, running through. And if you miss the big fault going through there, you're going to get into trouble, probably. And that's what you have to watch out for. And you're not going to find faults if you're not looking for them. It's also like a marriage. Anyway, so what are some of the discontinuities? Sheet joints. What you're seeing right here are sheet joints. Now, this rock we're looking at is the Mount Gibbons granodiorite. That was the strongest rock I ever tested in the lab at Berkeley. It's up around 40,000 PSI compressive strength. That's 10 times stronger than structural concrete to build a skyscraper. That is hard rock. If it's so hard a rock, how many joints can you see there? Can you count them? No, I can't count them. There's too many of them. Wow. So these are sheet joints and they're basically tensile fractures which form a never-ending series of blocks like an onion skin. So hard rocks are more brittle and you need to realize that. All right, part two. Let's talk about stress and strain aspects of rock. Here I am floating down the uh, Colorado River at about a mile 112.4, river mile 112.4. Suddenly I see the uh, Tapete Sandstone, which is the basal Cambrian unit, coming along here, and it hasn't, doesn't show any distortion for 100 miles, more than 100 miles, river miles, just nice and flat. And all of a sudden it goes... <laughs> What's going on there? Well, it's big old stretch marks. This is the West Kaibab monocline. And so this is a big structural feature where you have a fault running through here and you have the unit truncated and moved up and bent all around. And that's a definitely a uh, plastic deformation that occurred at some depth under the ground where there was a lot of confinement. Now, the more confinement you have, the more plastic the behavior is going to be typically. So let's look at pure rock. Now, where most geotechnical firms get into trouble is when they ignore engineering geology or they decide they have a rock problem over here and they're not used to dealing with rock problems and they say, well, we'll just treat the rock as an equivalent soil and give it a high fee angle of 55 degrees and we'll just we'll handle it that way. That way we don't have to go get a rock mechanics consultant because those guys are kind of expensive and they're kind of eccentric, which is true on both counts. Um, you'll get into trouble doing that because rock does not behave like soil. If there's anything I want to get through to you, that's it. And rock does not behave like A36 steel in your Mickey Mech lab, okay? In mechanics and materials. It doesn't. It doesn't behave like steel. Steel's nice and ductile, comes out of a steel mill in Pennsylvania with an ASTM certification. I haven't seen any rock yet that had an ASTM certification on it, okay? Doesn't come out of Pennsylvania. They have rocks in Pennsylvania, but not with ASTM certification. Okay, so what do rocks do? They are solid material between joints. So first off, you got to look at rock masses as what? It's like a sugar cube pile. It's jointed. All rock has joints. Like all Berkeley students have joints. Now that's another story. But anyway, um, different kind of joints. Um, so it's jointed. It's a jointed mass. Some of you have a sense of humor. Um, pure rock. Okay. It is an elastoplastic material. That means it's subject to elastic recovery and permanent deformation. Okay, let's see what that's what Dave's talking about here. Okay, if I take this thing, and this is stress, and this is axial strain, 
like an unconfined compression test on a cylinder of rock. Okay, and I start pushing it, what I'm going to see is an increasing resistance to strain as I increase the stress, and then I'm going to get up to about here, about 80% of the way to the top, and it's going to start fracturing. You start getting micro fracturing. So now my modulus is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. So I get to here before it catastrophically breaks, and I unload it. Now this is real important. This comes down to there. Uh-oh. What happened right here? That's the plastic deformation. That's the permanent strain you aren't going to get back. If you curse at your wife, guys, permanent strain on the relationship. You can't take it back. Don't do it. Cut your tongue out. Just count to 100. But don't say what you're thinking. Permanent deformation. Do permanent damage, okay? So now, when I reload from here, we call this the reloading curve. And this is the hysteresis, which is a function of the testing frame and everything that you're using and the system that you're uh, instrumenting. And as we come up now, now this is the true elastic modulus. Now watch. The elastic modulus is, is that, that orientation. And the elastic modulus is getting higher and higher and higher as I go up. This is not the elastic modulus because it's an elastoplastic material. Ah. You're getting a lot of trouble with this if you get solid mechanics person in there that doesn't understand that rock has all kinds of, of, of uh, imperfections in it and it's highly anisotropic and it's subject to permanent deformation. So as you go back up this, now you're seeing the true elastic behavior as you reload. Now you get up into here and it's going to start micro fissuring again and start breaking and turning over. So it's only by doing this load cycling that you see the true elastoplastic behavior of the rock. So if we actually look, this is a Navajo sandstone uh, test that I did in grad school for Glen Canyon um, Dam on the Colorado River. Now Glen Canyon Dam um, had this massive sandstone unit, the Navajo sandstone. It's 2,000 feet thick. So they put in this big, thick arch dam there. They could have put in a thin arch dam, but they couldn't get the rock to take the grout. So they had to end up thickening the dam about threefold. So there's more concrete in Glen Canyon Dam than there is in Hoover Dam. They're about the same height. But Glen Canyon Dam's much, much thinner, but it's wider than Hoover Dam. Now when the load came up on it, it pushed against the abutments and the abutments yielded and everybody got scared that's why I was working on it and they go uh oh we're not getting elastic deformation here we're getting plastic deformation so we took some pieces of this porous sandstone Jurassic sandstone cross bedded sandstone and when you load it look what happens you load it a little bit and you get a permanent set there's some crushing of the voids on the end platens just to start with so you're going to get some plastic deformation right off, right off the get-go. Now as this thing starts loading and you see this increasing, you see here we have poor closure, the stiffness of the testing system, and grain crushing at the ends of the specimen. That's what's going on down here in the lower 25% of the, you only get 25% of the ultimate strength. In this center zone, where you have linear elastic behavior, you're having stable fracture growth seen in permanent non-recoverable strain. So if I unload right here, I'm going to come down and there's going to be some permanent strain that I've just experienced right there. And that's what happened at Glen Canyon Dam, by the way. They didn't get anywhere close to this region up here. They were in this zone, way, way down here, probably about there but they got permanent deformation on both abutments. Now, as I, if, I, if I really load it, if I get some high load concentration, this you gotta be careful about, especially when you get out near a big free face. When you get up here, you get unstable fracture growth of cracks in the matrix, and this is, this is the danger zone. You get up in that zone, and you're gonna have all sorts of creep effects. What does creep mean? That means I bring the load up to here, and I'm getting all kinds of micro fissuring, and I stop. And now, I just get deformation that goes straight over to the right. And if it's brittle material, if it's real brittle material, this will come back down right here. And when this 
creep line gets over here, you'll get a failure, even though you never reach the peak strength. That peak strength is for the rate of loading that you're using. If you don't use as fast a rate of loading, you don't get as high a strength. Ah, that's uh, something to appreciate. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's my specimen of Navajo sandstone. And when I test it and I get to the maximum strength up here, here's what my fractures look like. My fractures in unconfined compression tests are parallel to sigma 1. They're parallel to the maximum principal stress, which in this case is like that. And what happens here is you get a little veering of these on the ends because of the friction effect of the end platens. The end platens have friction with the sample, which gives you a pseudo confinement because of that friction right along that boundary. And now the specimen gets through going fractures, so its cross sectional area is diminished. It's hourglassed. So now it loses load carrying capacity very, very rapidly. And that's where rocks are scary. Not like, you know, not like strain hardening shales. They're nice. These things, not strain hardening. It's strain softening. In fact, it's, it just loses everything. So this thing slides down real fast. So you get down here, and what you start seeing is you start seeing frictional interlocking and macro shear. It's not true shear. It's a series of vertical fractures that then get conjoined and it looks like shear because of the pseudo confinement by the friction of the end platens. So you lose all load carrying capacity because of the diminishing cross section very, very rapidly. So with rock, confinement is everything. Now what does that mean? That means if I put a rubber band around this thing, a nice heavy rubber band, I can double or triple the compressive strength right now. Yeah, yeah. So confinement is tremendously important because rocks break under induced tension. And you can bet your butt I will ask you that on a question as a test question. You know, what controls rock behavior? Induced tension. That's the weak link is induced tension. And um, when you have a a core of rock like this water bottle and you load it like that it'll break in the sigma 1 direction in induced tension at anywhere from 1 12th to 1 70th of the compressive strength yeah very very low tensile strength now if we actually run a full range stress strain plot we see the true behavior and we can see how the elastic moduli are degrading with increasing permanent strain. So here, excuse me, there is the elastic modulus over here and here's what it was at the same level of stress when the sample was less fractured. So we're seeing a decay in elastic modulus with increasing axial strain and fracture. And we call this post-failure stiffness. There's the first one, and then here's the second one. Now the second one is affected by intra-block friction. That's the macro shear. See there, I say macro shear. Here I just have axial tensile fracturing, big long cracks along sigma one, so I'm losing strength very, very rapidly. Now I start getting this macro shear, and so I actually get some block mechanics that are helping me and it, re it reduces the stiffness and you can take more deformation. So if we look at the physical phenomena that are going in a full range stress strain curve, we see at point A we start getting very, very a um, lot of micro fissuring, so we're, we're losing our modulus. Right here, we start getting a very marked lateral dilatancy. So the sample's trying to bend outward. It's dilating. And then right about B, we get rapid fracture extension. And this comes down very, very rapidly. Then we get buckling of the slabs. And then down here, we get the macro shear friction between interlocking sections in this tail zone. So this is real important in mining, of course, that's what they deal with um, when, we, when we actually uh, do block caving in a mine, they're down in this region here. 
And that's, that behavior is very important. I and mean, that's where that comes from. Now, the stress-strain behavior of a natural rock is really a combination. So if we look here and say, well, this is the stress-strain curve on a sandstone, what's the sandstone constituents? Quartz, which is very, very strong, hardness of seven, and usually calcite cement. Calcite cement's a hardness of three. So I'm taking a hardness of seven, putting it with a, a matrix of three, and I get something that's a hybrid between them. And that's pretty typical for sandstone. So that's what's going on. Now when you use, when you increase the strength of the matrix, like on high strength concrete, um, Panama Canal was built with high strength concrete, 7,500 PSI concrete. Um, when, you, when you make this stronger, that takes this curve and brings it over here. Now you'll get much more brittle fracture at very low axial strain and you'll break cleanly right through the aggregate. But in regular concrete, when you break it, it breaks around the aggregate if you have strong aggregate. If you don't have limestone aggregate. It'll break around the aggregate. The higher the strength of concrete, when it does break, it'll be catastrophic. It'll always scare you. <laughs> and you'll see breaking right through the aggregate. And so it's much tougher stuff to deal with from a behavior point of view. So what's going on here is, I want to get through to you, is the shape of the stress-strain relationship depends on confinement and the stiffness of the rock in comparison to the stiffness of the, st of the testing machine and it also depends upon the rate of loading. If I load the sample very, very slow over years, here's the path it's going to take. If I load it really, really fast, I'm going to get lots and lots of mobilized strength and then this is going to come down. So you have this section here, which we call the viscoelastic flow region. And we have some minimum fundamental strength that you can never get below, even in creep. And boy, that's, a, that, that's, that's something that's early on in the um, rock mechanics literature out of Colorado School of Mines in the late 50s. Uh, very, very useful. I have seen this replicated over and over and over in all the projects I've worked on around the world where they've done a battery of tests on particular rock type. Now, here's another example of that. This is some work done by Bill Brace at uh, MIT, again in the, in the late 60s, where they're taking um, marble and they're jacketing it. So here's the unconfined compression test with full range stress strain curve. And it, there's the strength. And you say, well, that's the intrinsic strength. Well, that's the intrinsic strength when it's unconfined. What if I add more and more confinement? Well, if I add more confinement, it gets more and more plastic. See that? And here's that line that you never get under. Coming down like that. So it's increasingly plastic behavior with increasing levels of confinement. And that's something to really keep in mind. You have to ask yourself, am I here? And the further into the cliff, the further into the ground I get, the more I'm going to go to here or to here or up into here maybe. Now when you're dealing with oil wells, you know, they're out in this zone. <laughs> they're down there below 16, 18,000 feet like this one that just went wild down on the Gulf Coast. You know, that thing had a, a mile of water confinement and then it went, you know, way down past that. Another 10,000 feet. That, that stuff was coming from 16,000 feet down. That's a tremendous pressure head change that was going on there. It's a lot more difficult to deal with than anything we do in civil works construction where we're just dealing with you know, one, two, or three atmospheres at the max most of the time. All right. Here's Solenhofen limestone. This is another one that comes out of the Ruhr area, which is a, a standard um, rock that's used all over Europe in rock mechanics research. Solenhofen has a lot of uh, coal beds in it. And so we're looking at the el elastoplastic behavior of this Solenhofen limestone and looking at the, re the measured relaxation. So here we're going to load this thing up, and then we're going to look at the plastic deformation and how much of this is plastic and how much is elastic. We're going to take this thing all the way up and now we're going to unload it. And when this thing comes down, there's your plastic deformation. So the plastic deformation was from there 
to there. Pretty, pretty significant. They really took this thing out. So this is all plastic, and this is the elastic portion. You can see here it's about five to one, four to one, five to one, plastic versus elastic. So that's under significant lateral confinement. So when we do laboratory compression tests on rock, and we talk about the modulus, which we need for our computer programs like UDEC, uh, you have to be careful here what number you're using. Are you using the secant modulus, this one, which a lot of people like to use? Are you using the true elastic modulus, which you have to do unloading curve and loading to get? And are you realizing that the elastic modulus down here at this stress level is a different number from up here at this stress level? And this is really important when you start modeling things like the deformation of Glen Canyon Dam into its yielding abutments. The more it pushes into the abutments, the stiffer they get. So you can't use the old number when you were down here when you started. Now you're up here somewhere. And so that E value is actually changing. Boy, they didn't tell you that in mechanics and materials, did they? I don't think they even tell it in most courses. Now, Goodman introduced the concept of modulus of permanent deformation in his book, his textbook, um, Introduction to Rock Mechanics in 1980. And I found this very, very useful in my practice. So what he's doing here is you run a full range curve and you run these things up and down and then you look at this permanent strain here and you actually bring this up, bring that down. It's a very easy construction. You can program the computer to do it. And you have M here, which is the modulus of permanent deformation for the stress zone that you're going to be working in with your tunnel underneath the peak of Mount Blanc or something like that. So you got to realize that if you have something that exhibits permanent set, with each cycle of loading. There's permanent set one, two, and three for those three different levels of stress. You need to know what M is if you're really going to try and model this thing uh, with any sort of uh, even seeming accuracy. Now you got to remember, I told you last week, how good can we do with rock mechanics on predicting strains? You remember the number? 300%. 300%. That's if you do all the things right. Now, more circles. What do you need to know about more circles? I found more mistakes by practicing geotechnical engineers, even those with DSC degrees from MIT, right here. Let's go through what some of the mistakes are. Number one, everybody loves to do big more circles and get the C and the phi values so you can put them as input in your computer program and you can solve all the world's problems. Isn't that neat? And that's, you know, by increasing the confinement here, the red one is unconfined, the blue one's in, you know, more confinement, the green's the most confinement. Yeah, we get this nice thing coming down here. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean a whole lot unless you've got a mine that's 500 feet deep. If you're doing something that's a civil work project and you're up near the ground surface, you know what your confinement is? Atmospheric pressure. Zero. It's air. You don't have any confinement. Oh. Down here? Yeah, down here. This is where all the problems are, kids. This is where all the failures occur. This is where all the rock slides occur. This is where all the problems I ever dealt with occurred, where there's very little confinement. I wasn't drilling oil wells down to 35,000 feet, okay? So don't look at too much of this because you're not operating in that area when you're doing the bank building basement. Yeah, you got a 60, 70, 80 foot high vertical rock excavation. What's the confinement? Zip. That's what the confinement is in this direction, in the sigma three direction. It's a zip. Okay, so what does this curve actually do? It's not linear. They're lying to you in Mickey Mick when it comes to rocks. Lie, lie, lie. Okay? What happens is this thing is curvilinear and it comes down and it's even with the tensile strength right here. The little blue thing is the tension test. Ah, ah. And that's where you're operating is down here. So what's the phi angle? Well, phi angle is very steep right here and then it gets less and less and less and less and tangential to that phi angle when you get up here about there. So this is a dangerous place to play. 
Now, you're in big doo-doo if you have something that has very low tensile strength, as in carbonate cemented sandstones. They got very low tensile strength. Okay, so here, this little curve can be very, very small, which makes this failure envelope very, very steep. So what you're trying to back out of all this are strength parameters, friction and cohesion. And if you leave it to a young engineer, they'll tell you that cohesion here is 122 kilopascals. If you draw it the way you're supposed to draw it, you can see that cohesion's something a lot less than that. Watch out. Now, if you saturate this and you got anything that's shaly, argillaceous, you're going to see a two-thirds reduction in C. Now, I used to always get, when I get on a damn panel and we're looking at stuff like this, and I give that little speech, my, my biggest enemy i got to watch out for is a soil mechanics professor because they have a religion. It's called the C-Fee religion. And they're taught that C is an intrinsic property and is not influenced by pore pressure at all. That is bunk. It's bunk. If it was true, we wouldn't get landslides when the pore pressures get higher. Not too many landslides occur when there's no water. All right. Be also careful when you're evaluating elastic modulus values. The terms used connote different kinds of calculations. So what I'm showing you here is I'm plotting with this one right here. That's the circles. That's the secant modulus. Everybody loves to use the secant modulus because that gives you the biggest number. And it's the one that has the least to do with reality. Okay? Here's the modulus of permanent deformation shown with the triangles. So the modulus of permanent deformation is M, and that's this one that's right here. And then the next one down, the squares, is the slope of the virgin compression curve. And that's what all the kids who have did their regular bachelor's degree in engineering that take in mechanics and materials, that's what they'll all calculate, is that one. They'll use the, the, the actual load curve without any loading and unloading. And then you actually uh, have uh, the true elastic modulus, which is the circle. And that's this one way down at the bottom which is a big difference from the secant modulus. Look at the change. <laughs> wow. So that's why so many of the finite element models that we have geotechnical firms doing are just bunk. They're just totally wrong because they don't go out and get the right expertise to be working on them. And then they get clients that say things like this. Well, it's rock mechanics stuff. Boy, I don't know. I don't, I don't do that. I stay away from rock mechanics and geophysics. They just, you know, we don't, we don't spend money on those. Why? You've got a dam here that's got a yielding above it. Well, because we hired three different firms and we got three different answers. And I look right back at them and I said, you hired three doctors. Don't hire one from Rolla. You hire three doctors, you're sure as hell going to get three different answers, too. But, but, one of them might be right. I had a doctor that was right. He told me I was going to die. I am. Sooner or later. <laughs> okay? So just because you get different answers doesn't mean that one of them isn't the right answer. But that's how people think. They think, oh, I threw all this money away. I got different answers. All right. So the elastic modulus also varies with the stress level and the induced strain. So here I'm looking at stress level. I'm looking at the elastic modulus and PSI times 10 to the sixth. And I'm looking at percent axial strain on Navajo sandstone. And look what I'm seeing here. There's the elastic modulus when I have 200 PSI on it. Here's the elastic modulus when I have 1,000 PSI, and here's the elastic modulus when I have 2,000 PSI. Isn't that interesting? So the elastic modulus is not constant, but it depends on the stress level. All right. The most important concept I want you to learn about is what I call strain incompatibility. This is rock mechanics. In, in a, uh, the most important thing you're going to learn out of this whole lecture. Strain incompatibility. What does that mean? When I look at an outcrop and I have one kind of material here, 
that is very stiff and it's sitting on something that's very plastic, you're going to have trouble. It's just like, you know, the thin man marrying the fat lady. You know, who's going to be on top? Okay? There's going to be some strain and compatibility going on there. Okay? And so if we look at a silty, stiff member, very high stiffness, very low axial strain where you have rupture. Whereas something that's a lot mushier, lower modulus, can strain for a lot longer time before it reaches its peak strength. And so you have a strain incompatibility. At this stress level, this one's going to strain a whole bunch, and this one's going to strain very little. See that? At that stress level, right there. Let's go across. So that stress level, there's the strain on that material. This material right next to it's going to strain that much. Well, something's going to happen. And that's why you always see trouble at the interface between a shale and a limestone. Limestone's a crystalline material, shale's a plastic bubblegum material, especially if it's out near the cliff face where it's not confined. Shale's not going to hurt you if it's confined and in the mountain and can't slide out anywhere. You keep a lot of load on it, it's not going to bother you. It's when you get out to a free face and the shale has somewhere to relax to that you're going to get trouble. And that's what happened on the Panama Canal. If they would have you know, put a whole bunch of tendons in there and held everything in there, the Cucaracha Shale wouldn't have degraded and lost 80% of its strength. That was a strain-driven process. And what do we do in school? We look at everything from a stress point of view. Stress, stress, stress. In rock mechanics, get stress out of your brain. The stress isn't the problem. You're not going to have high enough stresses in civil projects to bust granite, okay, unless you're putting bombs on it, all right? But you're, what you will have is strain incompatibilities, and that's what's driving your problems you're going to get, like you see right here. I get highway departments all the time and railroads calling me out saying, what do I do about this? This is raveling. And they always are calling you about shale seams and shale slopes because they're real tough to manage. They're like trying to sweep up the dust in your garage if you left all your doors open all the time. You, know, you go out there with the kids, you sweep everything up, you make it look nice, and what happens a week later? You're back at it again. Welcome to shale slopes. They always say to me, I want to come out here and fix it and not have to come back again. Mm, well, there are some things you can do, but they all cost money. Of course, everybody's shopping around trying to find the thing that doesn't cost money. Okay, so strain and compatibility. If I load something, I got something stiff here, stiff there. It's like two, two two by fours with some toothpaste in between. And where's all the deformation going to occur? It's going to occur in the soft material. So you get deformation. And that's not going to bother anybody because as I densify this, I'm going to make this more brittle and make it stronger. But it's also going to have more stored elastic strain energy. And shale has lots of stored elastic strain energy. Lots of it. Okay. So now, same situation, but I have a cliff face right here. And now the shale has somewhere it can migrate to because I got no confinement out here. And then the shale, after it moves over here, it's plastic and it's going to create tensile fractures in the brittle material above it and below it because of strain and compatibility. And of course the shale can dry out and desiccate, the wind comes along, removes the shale, and pretty soon the cliff is undercut and that block falls out. Because the block has nothing holding it there any longer except its own tensile strength up here somewhere. The block falls down. That's a very, very common failure mode. All right, so if we look at this, and we look, uh, and then what I'm, what I'm showing you right here is I have a, a sandy bed, a sandstone, right next to a silty sandstone. And one of them is almost twice as strong as the other one. And we're looking at lateral dilation here. And you can see the peak strength is at this strain on that one and at this strain on this one. So this is an Entrada sandstone, two faces. Now, this silty one is the one that gets natural rock arches in it. This is more stronger. It's stronger, but it's more brittle. And the mushy stuff doesn't forms the roof on the arch, 
but not the arch itself. So if we actually go back and we look at a cross-bedded sandstone sequence like this, we have all these tangential contacts, and we got bottom set beds and four set beds. What we see here in the Navajo sandstone is we had an aeolian deposition in the upper third of the formation with the offshore winds going that way and the cross beds heading easterly and northeasterly. But when you look over here in the lower part of the formation, we have very, very fine grain subaqueous four set beds. Then we have subaqueous cross beds, which are huge, big things. And then we have little top set beds coming across here and we get shale seams in there. So this is all one unit, but at the same time in history, you had one material over here, another material there, another material here and here, and still another material there, and they all get looking like that when you're done. So you see cross beds going this direction, cross beds going that direction, and people back in the old days looked at this and said, oh, well, the winds must have shifted. The winds went you know, to the west, and then they changed to the east. No, this is actually subaqueous deposition. Marzoff's PhD thesis at UCLA back in the early 70s, 79, figured that out. Um, so I've shown you this before if you've taken other classes with me, but this is deposition versus diagenesis. Now diagenesis is the term we use in petroleum engineering uh, to describe the petrology that occurs when uh, soft sediments are buried and lithified into rock. So what you see here is sandstone has very high porosity. That means you pack down the sandbox, you pour the coffee into it. What's the coffee do in the sandbox? Just goes right through the sand. So it has a high permeability, high hydraulic conductivity. But we're going to use the colloquial term permeability. Um, OK, so what happens is it has quick cementation. It is so pervious that it very rapidly gets cemented in geologic time. That's the first thing that's going to get cemented out there is the thing that's the most pervious and porous. Think about it. Because it's going to have all this water moving through it that has dissolved salts in it. Carbonate's one of the big ones. Now, if you have subaqueous forset beds and you have a little half inch seam or one inch seam of shale in here, which is real common when you have four set beds coming across the top. Now you're going to have intermediate percolation. It's going to take a lot longer because you have one groundwater compartment here and another entirely different compartment here. Now I had this occurring out at Zion Park uh, when I started looking at problems on the cliff face along the Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel. And I had it on the Glen Canyon Power Plant Tunnel, which had killed, both of them had killed a lot of people. So they were, the government wanted to know, you know, why are these people getting killed? And turns out, when I looked at this material, it was silica cement. This was wickedly stiff, hard stuff. This is going to chew up your dozer blade. It's going to chew up your ripper blade. And the stuff right above this little seam was carbonate cement. Same sand different cement, different material. Boy, you want to be on the lookout for this kind of stuff when you start doing landfill environmental assessments. You really got to look at the isotopes and look at the full spectrum of everything that's in that groundwater. That groundwater is like a fingerprint. It's going to tell you what's going on. And it's not simple. If you have one of these things horizontal, it can be very simple. But if it's going through at some sort of angle or it's a fault or some faults and little shale beds create groundwater compartments. And every groundwater compartment has its own fingerprint. You just got to spend the money to see what it is. I can tell you how old the water is using isotopes. And I can tell you a lot about the diagenesis by looking at that chemistry in those different groundwater compartments. And they're going to affect the strength and the behavior of those materials. Now down here in the bottom set beds, these guys are very low permeability because they've got all the fine grain materials. So they take forever to get cemented because something that's a low permeability, 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9 centimeter per second, this thing's 0.5 to 1 centimeter per second. This takes millions of years to undergo diagenesis. So now I've started out with a sample that's that big and 
It's crunched down. It has a much higher density. It's much more brittle because of its low permeability. And it's much stronger, but it's more brittle. Mm. It's like taking steroids. You can look nicer, but you ain't going to live as long. Okay. So we go out in the field, and we want to learn to be astute observers of things in the field. You get nothing else out of my classes. That's what I want you to get. Look at the outcrops. Road cuts are wonderful. My wife doesn't like me looking at them while I'm driving, but I sneak a few peeks in, okay? And uh, what you see is things like this. You see a cliff face coming down. That's what we're seeing right here. Nice place to take a rest. And all of a sudden, I'm undercut. And then I have a slope. And there's a bunch of debris mantling the slope, the debris that's fallen out of here. And you ask yourself, was ist los? What's going on here? I got profuse exfoliation occurring just in this zone. And what it is, is it's a silty, sandy siltstone. It's very high strength material, but it has very, very brittle behavior. And so what's happening is you're getting more fractures in here and more pieces that are coming down here and sitting on the slope, mantling the slope. Now here's the failures they had out there. This is uh, gallery number two on the Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel. And that was the biggest single rock opening in the United States until the building of um, Yerba Buena Tunnel on the, in San Francisco Bay in 1937. Uh, this is about 135 feet across. That's a big opening and about 65 feet high. And that was a ventilation opening for a side canyon tunnel that this highway went through. Now, look right over here. That's gallery number six. And gallery number six, in an enlargement right here, failed catastrophically in 1960, about 30 years after it was built. And what happened here is you have joints here. The, the, the systematic regional joints are parallel to the cliff face. And they are over here as well. But this was very, very brittle facies in this lower area. Very strong rock, but very brittle. And once this thing started breaking and fracturing, it started shifting load dramatically. And the thing just went out of control very, very rapidly in a matter of just a few years and they had to concrete in the opening but when they did that that also caused stress concentrations that continued for the next 20 years and that's why I was there looking at it I think this would be a good point to take a little uh, a little break we'll take our mid term break right now and then pick up in five minutes
All right, something I forgot to mention. Um, I always want you to read the book to get the basic stuff. I'm hitting things that aren't in the book as adjunct to the book. So you've got to read the book to get the basic background on the basic things. And when you do the problems this week, be sure to check the errata sheet that I gave you that's posted for the textbook. There's some mistakes, and you, if you, you really need to have that errata sheet for a couple of the problems because some of the numbers he gives are uh, incorrect. I think it's in this chapter, but I'm not positive. It might be. Yeah, it is. And problem number five, there's a, um, there, there's a number there that's 12 times 10 to the 7th. It should be 15 times 10 to the 7th. So in problem five, there's a correction you have to make for sure. That, that was my recollection from past years. So... Um, okay. Otherwise, it isn't, the, otherwise, the problem doesn't work out. All right. Now we're going to talk about uh, rock strength and fracture anisotropy. Now, when I was doing my test, this is again Navajo sandstone. You can see we got a we got a specimen here. It's an NX core. It's being tested, and you can see we're getting these sigma one extension fractures that are parallel to sigma one, parallel to the maximum principal stress, which is like this, and then we're starting to get buckling. And you can see our cross-sectional area here, our effective cross-sectional area, is diminished to about 55% of the sample at this point in the test. So the actual stress we're getting here is much higher than I'm showing on my stress-strain curve, because my stress-strain curve is assuming the full cylindrical area. So that's another problem which we don't account for very well. Um, but your generation probably will start accounting for these things. Now, here's how I got interested in all this stuff. I'm, I'm climbing out in the Colorado Plateau. I'm a rock climber, so I'm going out there. I'm trying to get, uh, get on as an extra in Clint Eastwood's uh, 1973 thriller called Iger Sanction. So I, we go out to Zion Park and then out to... Uh, uh, Monument Valley, and he actually used world-class climbers. So we were just college guys. You know, we didn't get to get in the movie, but we got to watch some really good climbing going on. But we noticed that when we started climbing on these rocks, that you know, one part was just profusely exfoliated right here, what I'm standing on, and this stuff above it was not. So if you if you draw and look at my sketchbook, this is how it looked to me in my sketchbook. I had these these joints coming down. Um, across the bedding. See the bedding right here? The bedding's horizontal and the joints are crossing it at an angle, about 30 degree angle. And then I get up here and the joints are very far apart and they're going up like that. Now as a, as a rock climber you use all this kind of stuff for support and for aid. So um, what I found was the stronger rocks tend to be more brittle and exhibit closer fracture spacing. So this is a stronger rock more brittle, closer fracture spacings. This is a mushier rock. It looks stronger when you look at it, but it's actually not. So kind of, kind of fascinating. So then when I start uh, testing these things, and here I'm looking at uh, axial strain for silty Navajo sandstone. That's the real strong basal unit at the bottom of the formation. And what I'm doing here is I'm testing it parallel to bedding, which is not as strong, and the solid line is perpendicular to bedding. You see, perpendicular to bedding is much stronger than parallel to bedding, about another third. And the limiting strain is also greater. And so that shouldn't uh, surprise us because layered sedimentary rocks and foliated metamorphic rocks are always going to exhibit some anisotropy. And that's crucial when you start looking at rock slides and slope stability issues. You have this anisotropy. So most rocks are brittle, and so they break under induced tension. So I get this little this specimen in there, this little cylinder of rock, and then I put this load down through it, and what I'm doing right here is I'm putting LVDTs, Linear Variable Differential Transformers, around it, the specimen, at three different places, 60 degrees apart, to measure dilatancy. And then what I found was the rock always breaks in induced tension. 
semi-parallel to the maximum principal stress. But I also found that modest lateral confinement would significantly increase the observed strength. That's why rock bolts can be so effective. So if I put my hand around this thing, or if I put a rubber band around it, it made a huge difference because that limits the ability of the rock to dilate. So this is why when you go underground and they have a room and pillar mine, they're wrapping the pillars with cables or they're putting rock bolts through them. And you're going to get a lot of cluck for your buck putting in just three rock bolts 60 degrees apart and then putting big plates on and locking it down. Big, big uh, impact. So here's the typical sequence of crack propagation that I saw uh, in an unconfined compression test. And you see here where you actually see these slabs induced tension slabs that break off and when I take the LVDTs off after the test you can see here where the slab is broken off there it is sitting right there and you can see all these up and down fractures and see how this is coming in on a V that V is created by the pseudo confinement of the end platens and then we get the buckling now if I carried the test further I get the macro shearing coming across and then, in the old days, people incorrectly called that the shear strength. It really was not the shear strength. So here, we're got, we carry the test on further, and what we see, we get more and more buckling, and then finally we get the macro shear joining up, and these are actually a series of little vertical up and down fractures, and macro shear, and when you're done, you get a specimen that looks like this. And what you have is, uh, after this shear is far enough, you can't carry any more load because your load, your cross-sectional area has gone down to a wedge, down to nothing. So it's a pseudo macro shear displacement that's going on right here. It's not true shear like we have in soil mechanics. Um, now, variation in compressive strength versus bedding inclination is really, really important. Now, if I go back and I look at this and say, okay, what's the angle of my fracture? Here's vertical. What's the angle between the fracture and the bedding? So if my bedding is horizontal, um, that's going to be zero. And if the bedding is between the night between the stress and the bedding is 90 degrees, it's going to be like this. Now, right here, what you see is 21, 22 degrees. That's 45 minus phi over two. That's like that. 45 minus phi over two means I have bedding going like this, and I have principal stress coming down like that. And look what happens to the strength. Yeah, strength drops to almost nothing. So when I have bedding inclined at 45 minus phi over 2, I'm hosed. Or if I have a joint oriented 45 minus phi over 2, well, guess what? Most of your valley side joints are inclined at around 45 minus phi over 2. That's why you have so many rock slide problems down in narrow V-shaped valleys. Here's what I'm trying to show you, okay? So here's a sample where I'm working with the bedding being about 45 minus phi over 2. Right there. And here I start loading it. And when I start loading it, I'm going to get an extension fracture starting here and going up or starting at the top coming down. And in the middle of the test, I've reached maximum strength. I'm starting to get wedging. Here's what the sample looks like. I'm starting to get this necking down. I'm getting all this load going through that small little area. Very high stress concentration. And then I go to macro shearing and these blocks start falling out. And that's way down here. So by that point, so you can see the inclination of the bedding in this case, or the layering, plays a huge role in the behavior. Now you should be able to look at those pictures and just see that intrinsically uh, makes sense. So here's stress strain plots, this time from the Entrada land, uh, sandstone, which is a uh, younger than it sits on top of the, uh, the uh, Navajo. And here I'm actually looking at uh, uh, a test, a, a core that's parallel to bedding, 
So it doesn't have as much strength because of the 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 the, the, the uh, bedding goes right parallel with the uh, with the feature and with the maximum principal stress. And this is perpendicular. So the strongest it's going to be is when you're perpendicular to the bedding. And here you're parallel. Now at 45 minus phi over 2, you're going to be down here. They're going to be at the lowest you can possibly be. So same rock, different inclination to the maximum principal stress, you're going to get different answers. And this is a big deal when you start having an arch dam push into either abutment because it ain't going to be pushing into this abutment the same as that one if there's something that's coming across at an angle across the canyon. There's no way you're going to get the same behavior on both abutments. And that's where arch dams hurt because they're designed for homogeneous isotropic rock, which only exists in computer programs at universities. It doesn't exist in the real world. All right. Here's another one where I'm, look, I'm plotting variation of elastic modulus with inclination to bedding. And what I'm showing you here is this is the silty Navajo sandstone, the real stiff stuff, and it shows what you'd expect, which is parallel to bedding, lowest modulus, perpendicular to bedding, highest modulus. But then I got this one, which is the buff sandstone. Now, this is the one that was giving us all the trouble. The one that was causing all the cave-ins in the tunnels. Because they were side hill tunnels, they were near the side of the canyon, so they'd have ventilation. They had ventilation additives every thousand feet for the carbon monoxide to mix in a thermodynamic ventilation. Because that's the biggest problem in a vehicular tunnel, is ventilation. And these don't have a whole lot of traffic, so you can do side hill vents. This material is leached of its iron cementation. That's why it's buff colored. And a lot of, it's le also leached of a lot of its carbonate. So it's low tensile strength, like 1 40th to 1 70th the compressive strength. Now Griffith failure criterion, which we assume in all of solid mechanics and civil engineering, is 1 8th TO is 1 8th of compressive strength in two dimension, 1 12th in three dimension. And concrete obeys that. Concrete, you can almost always count on. 1 12th, the compressive strength is a tensile strength. You don't know the tensile strength, you use that number, you're going to be right in the zone. Rock, you can't do that. Rock doesn't come out of a ASTM certified you know, mixture. And so here, you start seeing funny stuff going on. And here, I actually got a very high modulus at 45, 50 degrees to the bedding. And then it dropped back down again. So perpendicular and parallel, I was very weak. But 50 to 45 degrees, I have a much higher modulus. Wow, go figure. And so um, that's pretty typical of real world rock mechanics. All right, part five. What are some of the concepts and impacts of rock stiffness? Well, this is what I was working on. This is what the Park Service hired me to look at, was the Gallery 3 failure. At Gallery 3, they lost an entire column here, about 80,000 um, tons of rock that came off about a 500 foot high uh, piece that came tearing off and this was gallery three and the tunnel lining was exposed right there. So there's only about a foot of rock across some of this zone. So this is incredibly overhanging up here and very high stress in here and so they put in ribs inside when this happened back in 1958 and by 1978 all the ribs were cracking up. Now we know today what happened there is, and that's when you're doing tunneling, you don't want to put in a stiff inclusion. The stiffer your lining is, the more load it's going to draw with time. You want to use a lining that is flexible and has the same stiffness and moduli of elasticity and deformation as the rock. Then the rock doesn't know the tunnel's there. We call that loosely the new Austrian tunneling method. There's nothing new about it, and there's nothing Austrian about it, but it sounds sexy to say that. So what you did here is by using more steel and more concrete, which is what every engineer likes to do. We have the, you know, the, that, that German 
um, feeling, you know, how are we going to protect the U-boat docks that the Allies are trying to bomb by using more concrete and more steel to make it stronger? That actually kills you here. But you don't want to make an over-reinforced uh, system. Remember, the steel's there to pick up tension. You put too much steel in there, you're going to start picking up compression with your steel, and your steel's going to buckle. That's called over-reinforcement. And there's a lot of dunderheads out there doing that kind of stuff because they just haven't worked under somebody um, who's been able to mentor them about the realities of uh, reinforced concrete design. Okay. Well, one of the things I noticed when I was working in the Gersley mine, my first job out of college, working for Rio Tinto Zinc, U.S. Borax, we go into this mine. It had closed down in 1925. And when we were in the andesites on a main gangway and we hit a cross cut, I would see these kind of fractures pattern. I drew them in my notebook. That's what this is from. And very closely aligned fractures. And that tells me that the zone of influence around this opening was about three quarters of the tunnel diameter. This is the zone of relaxation around this opening. Now we went on down the gangway and we got into conglomerate. The tunnel was actually larger. But now when I went through a cross cut, look at this. The spacings were much further apart. And more than 1D out from it. And this is what triggered me to go to graduate school and try to figure out what was going on there. Because nobody I talked to in the company could explain that to me. You know, we got the same load on us, same mountain. What we have is two different geologic materials. This one's the brittle material, much stronger, but it has profuse jointing. That seemed backwards to me because I hadn't had any solid mechanics background yet. I was just a pure geologist. I had mechanics and materials and soil mechanics and that stuff uh, as an undergraduate, but I hadn't had a lot of good solid mechanics training yet. Okay, so when we look at the area underneath the stress strain curves. Here's the basalt, and here is the conglomerate. And this is the available strain energy for the conglomerate. That's the available strain energy underneath the curve for the stress strain curve for the, for the andesite. And see, this stuff's much mushier. So you load it out here, and you have a lot of strain energy that was burned up in fracturing. So this thing doesn't come back but to right there. This is at the same stress level. Interesting. And they're right next to each other. OK. Here's another one where I take buff Navajo sandstone. This is my problem member now. And I'm going to test it parallel to jointing. Parallel to bedding, I mean. This is parallel to bedding. 21 degrees to the bedding and 68 degrees to the bedding. And you can see my strength goes up and the lowest is when I'm parallel to the bedding. Well, that's because of the anisotropy of the bedding. Now, if I do full range stress strain plot where I actually try to come down the other side, and this is very hard to do. You have to, you have to work out a testing system. This was early on in my testing career. And so I'm, I'm having uncontrolled fracturing coming down here because I don't have a feedback system shutting the machine down. If you, if you actually build onto the specimen those LVDTs and they, they actually detect the rapid dilation, you can back the load off faster. But I was trying to do it by hand. This is about as good as you can do by hand. And that's post-failure stiffness right there. And what this is, this vertical line, is the machine stiffness. So what I'm doing is I have these periods of uncontrolled fracturing. And uh, so it's a tough kind of a test to run along and do. Now here's one. This was a R.D. Bailey Dam. This was in uh, West Virginia. It's a Morgantown district of the Corps of Engineers. And it was the Nuttall Sandstone. Uh, but it turned out it was the Nuttall Quartzite because I was getting unconfined compressive strengths around 23,000 PSI. That is nasty stuff. And of course, the contractor got in there, and um, the Nuttall sandstone had a lot of mica in it. It's a very old unit, but it had a lot of mica. And he could rip that, because mica's got very low uh, strength along 
the planes of the, of the foliation. But when you get into something that had no mica and it was a pure quartzite, that's a hardness of seven, and it'll beat up your equipment something fierce because your equipment, you know, hardened steel is 5.4 to 5.6, and this is seven. So it really beats up the equipment very bad. So what I started finding was that the shape of this post-failure envelope really depended on the rock stiffness and the testing machine versus the rock specimen stiffness ratio and the scale of the test of the specimen being tested. And Dick Binyowski helped me in all that. Uh, Werner Werbersick Wer actually did this under Dick for his PhD thesis down in South Africa before Dick came up to um, Penn State. So here is the rest of these samples of the Nuttall sandstone and you can see you get a family of curves that had class two brittle behavior. And this brittle behavior is, is means that our machine has a real problem because of the stiffness and the scale of the sample in trying to handle uh, doing a full range curve on it. And so these are very, very brittle kinds of materials. This is out of Werber Six thesis. So what I ended up doing was having to test the machine and get the machine stiffness first. Now, what you do is you take the sample out of there. Take the sample out of the machine, bring the steel end platens together, and now you crank this thing down on itself to test the machine stiffness. And what you'll see is these big screw cylinders will start bowing because this thing is locking down on itself, steel to steel. And so the distortion of the machine is stored elastic strain energy. And that's why when you see somebody doing concrete cylinders and they're blasting the concrete, you hear the concrete go BAM! That's a crappy test. That's a no good crappy test. That's telling you that that machine is way too soft of stiffness for the specimen. What's happening there is the machine frame is taking all the stored elastic strain energy and when the sample starts to fail it unleashes all that stored energy on the sample and blows it up. You're not getting true behavior. You're, you're getting a behavior that's been induced by the distortion of the frame. So you want this machine to be a thousand times more stiff than the sample or you're not going to get a good answer. And that's what I learned from Bieniowski. So I had to leave the rock mechanics lab at that point in Berkeley and switch over to the structures lab because the structures people only wanted had a big enough and expensive enough machine for me to carry out my tests on. All right. Tensile strength of rock. Obviously, I think this is really important. So I want to talk about it. Here I am on the Colorado River, my first trip down the Grand Canyon, 1978. I'm about mile, river mile 10 right here, and I'm looking at the Kaibab limestone, and this is the Toroweep limestone down here. And everywhere you go down this river, you'd see these kind of things. What am I looking at right here? A big old what? Fresh rock slide fresh rock fall. And when you look at these rock falls, what I want you to see, I want you to look at the back and you see a joint right here going this way. And this joint face back here is like that to it. That is a big joint face there. And this is a joint face here. And the bedding is semi-horizontal. Now what's happening here, a big block came off here and it dropped maybe, you know, 150, 175 feet. And then what happens to it? It, get, it gets all busted up to smithereens through induced tension. So if you take a piece of rock, we take any rock here, we pick it up, and I come over to this table and I just go, bang, it'll break in induced tension. So rock doesn't have to fall very far to break. It's very, very weak in induced tension. And that tension is usually induced by bending or simply by dropping it a short distance. So it splits, splitting tensile strength. Not pulling tensile strength, splitting tensile strength. And so that's what we're going to be looking at here. So what are some tensile failure modes? Uh, one is if we have a slab, 
We see these things all the time when we're in glaciated areas. We'll see an arcuate pull out mold and we'll see a valley side exfoliation joint and the slab just pulls out. That's what you see at Yosemite Park. That's, just a, that's a direct tension type of failure mode and you'll get an arcuate failure up here because that's the loci of equal tensile strain. There's an arcuate distribution. And then it might have joints on either side that border it on either side. Now when you get underneath the ground uh, you'll actually see flexural tension. And here you'll see flexural tension if you're in an open pit mine or something. And you can actually get buckling failure down here. If you have strata that are semi-parallel to the slope, this will start dilating, come outward. That's flexural tension. And then indirect tension is the kind that we see statistically most often with underground openings. Especially if we get our openings too close together, we actually get indirect tension from the load coming down around the opening and that load splitting around and we get stress reversals where we get induced tension here, here, and up here. Now these don't usually hurt you because again there's nowhere for the stuff to go but up here in the roof those fall down and kill people. So that becomes an issue of safety and just maintenance. So bending stresses are pretty easy to analyze. We can analyze critical buckling pressure just using typical solid mechanics things. And we can actually look at these plates, which are very common in granitic rocks. And we, if we actually instrument these things, we'll actually see these things going up and down, even in sandstones, with uh, temperature cycles, as well as earth tides twice a day. So if you go down underneath the ground, and you put in an SR4 strain gauge across an underground joint in the rock, I will guarantee you that you'll measure twice a day diurnal stress and strain, dilation and closure, just with earth tides going by. So there's a lot of cyclic loading occurring due to earth tides and temperature change, as well as residual stresses and load stresses. So you got all these things going on concurrently. The rock has a memory of the loads it's been subjected to in its past. So rock is always going to be weak in induced tension, and a small amount of confinement here is going to make a big difference. Now where this all comes to play is when we go out and do a, a dam excavation, and we start excavating the abutments, these things start popping off on us. And they get real frustrated. They go, okay, we don't have solid rock anymore. I can ring on the rock and hear a hollowness to it. And Terzaghi told us, you know, forget it. You're not going to be able to keep excavating and not have these things pop out on you. What you're going to have to do is build a dam against it and then drill holes and grout. You better do a good job of grouting because you're not going to be able to hold all these things down, even with rock bolts. They tried to do that at Glen Canyon. They got 700 rock bolts on both abutments. So what we use is something called the Brazilian test, the Brazilian splitting tension test. Now how did the Brazilians come up with this? The same way we came up with a lot of things, by accident. What happened was they went to move some buildings. And when they went to move those buildings back in the 1950s, instead of using mahogany logs, they decided, well, you know, we, we have expertise in concrete. We'll do some post-tension concrete cylinders. So they built these high-strength concrete cylinders to roll these buildings on, to move these buildings across the square. And what they found out to their horror was as soon as they put the load on them, the things just split. So we came, they came up with the Brazilian splitting tension test. And this is what it looks like. It has about a 15 uh, degree contact area, seven and a half either side of the vertical axis. You put your disc of rock in there. So this rock is a 2.7 inches in diameter and one inch thick. And then I load it up and I load it until I see a crack, a little hairline crack form, and then the load carrying capacity drops off. Now, concrete is usually about one twelfth. Its tensile strength is usually about one twelfth the unconfined compressive strength. When I was testing rocks, I found I was anywhere between one twelfth and one seventieth, depending on porosity and weathering. Those are huge factors. One seventieth is a low tensile strength. And that was the problem in both these tunnels that had killed so many people. They would, do a, uh, they would shoot the tunnel face, and then they'd wait 
And the longer they'd wait, it didn't matter. When they went back in there and started mucking, the vibration would cause these roof uh, wedges to come down and kill everybody. And the owner of the company actually doing the Glen Canyon Tunnel got killed, leading his men. So here's what it looks like close up. Here's what the... Um, the loading apparatus looks like, and if we look at the sample close up, after the test is over, you can see it's the crack is smallest here, the aperture is greatest in the middle, this is splitting open, and then goes back to being closed up here at the edge. So it's a 0.5 to 1 length of diameter ratio, over 15% of the circumference, and you load it until you get this hairline fracture, and you'll see it in the... In the um, low deformation curve. It drops off very, very rapidly. Now here, I actually wanted to know what's the elastic modulus and tension. No one had done that before, so I actually came up with a way of doing that and then tested the sample and actually found, again, that I had to unload it in tension and that I actually had two different tensile values. I have the secant tension here and I have the actual el elastic tension value. So what I'm doing here is cycling the load back and forth in direct tension, trying to measure that. And um, here's a direct tension test, what it looks like. And so um, if I use the elastic modulus in compression, I get this line. If I actually use the elastic modulus in tension, I get this line, and this is what I actually had, and it came out to failure. So that shows how the elastic modulus is much less in tension than it is in compression, and how it diminishes very, very rapidly when you get above about 80% of the one cycle tensile load. Now that's for one cycle of loading. The bad news is still to come. Um, what if you don't, what if you take the one cycle of loading and say that's, that's the static tensile strength. And now let's say I don't load it to 100%. Same sample, but I'm going to load it to 40%. Or let's say 65%. How many cycles of loading till it fails? Well, about 12 on that one. That was the brittle stuff. This is the brittle stuff. This is the modeled Navajo sandstone, the weathered stuff, and it was much more mushy, and I had to load it out to about 55 cycles, and then it failed. So what you find is, by cyclic tensile loading, the actual tensile strength is far, far lower than we get in our one cycle test. There's your bad news, and that's why you see the greatest number of foundation problems with reservoirs where they do a lot of load cycling. Because you've got load cycling going on naturally to begin with, but if you have reservoir load cycles, you just make this a lot worse. So the rock is very, very weak in tension and it's very sensitive to load cycling. Now, here's some of the definitions I used for looking at anisotropy effects. So I tested all these disks at different geometries. This is uh, end view. This is looking down on it from above. And you can see this is the load being put on it. And I'm looking at all these different effects to look at geometric effects. And what I started finding is, you know, pretty, pretty predictable. When you're perpendicular to bedding, you get a family of curves that's much lower than parallel to bedding. So strength and anisotropy really exists in splitting tension. That shouldn't surprise us. And then here, I have two different definitions for perpendicular. One along the bedding like this, and one transverse like that. And of course, this one, as you'd expect, much, much lower tensile strength. So this is the worst condition for low tensile strength, has been perpendicular to the bedding right along the beds, loading in the same plane. Here's variation in, and splitting tensile strength with a bed inclination varying the length to depth ratio. And this is for the silty Navajo sandstone. So this is the real strong stuff. They had 17,000 PSI compressive strength. And you can see here, you see again, one of them is twice what the other one is, depending which way you load it. Okay, so what does all this mean? 
I got to put it into engineering context because I'm an engineer. I, you know, I have my scientist side, so I've done all this science stuff. Now, what does all that mean? Let's put it into engineering context. What I'm looking at here is modified Griffith criterion. So there's your one eighth line, one eighth the compressive strength for the envelope. And that's for 2D, and here's your one twelfth for 3D. Now, if we look at all the ACI, the American Concrete Institute data out there, that's ah, pretty interesting. What you'll see is these little curves down here, that one is the upper bound for concrete, and this one is the lower bound. And you see the lower bound one's below 1 12th, but 1 12th, you know, cuts right through the mean of those two families of curves. So that's where all the data is, thousands and thousands of data points. So we, we, we know that. That's out there in the ACI literature. There's an article by uh, Jerome Raphael, by, I think about 1979, in the ACI Journal, where he took all the, the uh, tensile data for concrete around the world and plotted all of it. So it's a great, great paper to have on the shelf. So now, how do my rocks come out in all this? Well, here's my Navajo sandstone parallel to bedding. Here's my Navajo sandstone perpendicular to bedding. So perpendicular, I'm getting close to the 112, but parallel, I'm getting further and further and further away from it. So it's a real aberration. Now if we look down here even lower, here's my Entrada sandstone. That's where we have natural arches, National Park, Arches National Park. Why do they have so many arches? Because they got the lowest tensile strength on the face of the North American continent. That's why. That's that's what you see down here. Very, very low tensile strength. You know, nowhere close to the Griffith failure criterion. So welcome to rocks. Rocks uh, just don't cooperate. They don't do stuff. So you're messing around with rocks, you want to have rock people on your team. So here you are actually seeing it close up. What I was just showing you, I should have shown you this previously. So here's your your numbers for concrete. There's the concrete low one. There's the concrete upper one. Now that's the family of all the concrete disks. Now remember, concrete only gets up to here in maximum strength. So you can't go further than that. So 112, you know, 1 8th to 1 12th, pretty good. Um, it's going to work pretty well for you. So if you're designing that concrete lining right off the bat, you got trouble. That's why new Austrian tunneling method doesn't use concrete linings. Concrete's too stiff. What do they use? They use rock bolts and gunite. Gunite's mushy. It's much, much lower. It's air-blown concrete. It has high uh, porosity. You air blow it on, gunite on, and that seems to get us much closer to fooling the mountain that our opening isn't there. But it's very dependent on time, how soon you put it in after you do the excavation. The longer you let it relax, the bigger the zone of influence is going to grow, and your loads are going to grow, get higher. So if you take the weekend off without shooting it, you're going to get in big trouble. Now, tunneling contractors know that. So they're not going to, you know, once they cut it, they're in there with the rock bolts, and they're shooting it with the lining right now. They aren't, they aren't going to wait for the holiday or the weekend or something else. Um, but that gives you a nice picture of, of what's going on, the aberration with low tensile strength. All right, how's that play out for us in the real world? We're back to Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel. I'm looking across the canyon here, and there's gallery number five, and that's about 30 feet across there. These are full-grown trees on a ledge. Uh, everything you have there at Zion Park is on a colossal scale. We, we, we couldn't get out here and, and rock climb down these things because there weren't any ropes long enough. We had to have a rope manufactured that was a 500 foot line. We had to fly it up there and put it up and then use a bunch of lead weights and stuff and throw this thing out. And uh, first time we did that, it, the, the weight was so great, it ripped our anchor out and away the rope all went. We started all over again. And you know, you learn these kind of things. We never did get it so we could throw the rope over and not get it hung up somewhere. We just had to go over on faith and take Jumars with us in case we had to come back. And, um, and then when we get down there to some place like this, we'd have to try and unravel, unkink the line and throw it out again and so on and so forth. But when you do that, 
when you get on the face and you really start looking at things, you start realizing the primary systematic joints are the ones that are pervasive. They're linear, they cut through the, the, uh, the ground for long, long distances, and they convey water over long distances. And the water's going to flow through the joints. There's some water flowing through the matrix, but not much. Most of the groundwater in rock systems is flowing through joints. So if the joints are vertical and you don't drill an inclined boring, you're never going to find out what's going on with the groundwater. So every time I see a vertical boring around a dam site, I just yawn and I resign from the board. And I've had to do that in Missouri all the time. Because I say, well, we don't have anybody in Crawford County that drills incline holes. Well, that's great. Then see you later. Because I'm not going to work on a project here. I have vertical joints and I'm drilling vertical holes. You're going to miss the joints. That's colossally stupid. And, and what happens, they just keep shopping, looking for consultants that will tell them what they want to hear. So non-systematic joints are the problem because they're curvilinear. And these are the ones that get the unfavorable geometry on you. And so if you're loading them like this and you got 45 minus few over 2 geometry, guess what happens? This thing just slides out on you. Ouch. So that's the stuff you got to be real careful about and watch. So when you go out there and you look at these joint systems, you're looking for clusters. Joint clusters, the material in here is going to rot out as we talked about in chapter 3 on weathering. And you're going to get a lot more water. This is going to be like interstate highways for water. And if the joints are not completely continuous, they typically come down. This joint came down this way, this one came up that way, and they overlap each other. So they're not always perfectly contiguous. And you'll see that in the, in the groundwater chemistry in samples. Sometimes you won't find the... Um, the clay seam going through here, what you'll find is, is the joints aren't continuous. Now, every once in a while, you're going to see something like this, where you got this joint, this joint, this joint, and they're all kind of the same, and then you got these guys that are the Bobsy twins that are cutting 15 degrees different from the other ones. That's pretty common. I don't know what that's due to. That may be because these guys form from over here and move that way, and these form over here and move this way, and you got to this point, and some kooky stuff went on. And then you also have this problem when you're looking at it down on the valley side. You can't tell by looking which set you're looking at. You have one set going this way, one going that way, and in the face out here, they look the same. You gotta be real, real careful. So it's a three-dimensional game we're dealing with where you're using the structural visualization or spatial visualization, the artistic side of your brain, the side that most engineers are not favored towards. So people who are good in structural geology and rock mechanics have to be uh, right brain folks. They gotta be the artistic side because you gotta draw these pictures of what's going on. You have to draw a block diagram. Can't be a cross-section. Cross-section's 2D. So you also see this. You see there's a correlation between joint spacing and the geology, the type of unit, and the bedding thickness. The thinner the bedding, the closer the joints are together. The thicker the bedding, the more, the more uh, massive it is, the further apart the joints are. Now any rock climber knows this. Rock climbers don't look for shale to climb on. Boring. Very boring. They're looking for big, massive units that are cliff forming and that have much fewer joints because you've got nicer faces to climb on. Now, the other thing you'll see is preferentiality. There's always going to be one set that is more pervasive than another one. Pervasive. I didn't say perverted. Pervasive. Now, the pervasive set in this, in this case is set A. Set A is the one you're going to see on the air photo because there are many, many more of them out there and they're closer together. Set B is conjugate to it, but there's not as many of them. That's typically how it works. Typically you get two sets that are conjugate to each other and that are orthogonal to the bedding. This is real typical Missouri right there. We have a million square miles of flat-lying geology back here in the middle of the United States, and that's what it looks like. 
better get that picture. If you don't take any other picture out of my course today, take this one home. You're going to see this in your career. Now, if this is a has waste site, and you got some leachate, you got some dense non-aqueous phase liquid out there flowing down the joints, you see why I walk off the job when they won't do a what? Inclined hole? Do a vertical hole right there. What are you going to get? A-N. A-N. Absolutely nothing. That is a waste of money. A total and complete waste of money that only a moron consultant would do. A moron. And I'll say that. I've said that to some firms and I'm not, I haven't engendered myself to them. But that is stupid. You're not going to go out here and get water samples drilling a vertical hole with vertical joints. Doesn't work. It's a good way to run the, run the charges up and fleece the client, but it's, it's not going to get you anything. You have to do an inclined hole to intersect these things. And right away, what's your statistical bit here? If I run this way, parallel to set A, that's not going to be very representative either. Because set A has got a lot more freeways going on. So I really want to come in here and drill an angled hole and intersect as many set A's as I can. And the reason is, no two joints are alike. Here's the part that's so darn vexing about rock mechanics. When I go out and look at uh, rock slides, or a landslide, and I gut the thing out, and I get in there, I always find springs. One spring or more. And usually the spring is one joint that's sixteenth of an inch wide. And there's a thousand joints over here and a thousand over there that are relatively tight. Water flow through joints is a cube function of the joints length, height, and width. Length, height, and width. Multiply them together. The one that's a sixteenth of an inch wide is going to carry more water than a thousand tight ones over here and a thousand tight ones over there. And when you go out and drill holes, you're like a Polish minesweeper. You just drill holes like that, your chances of hitting that one sixteenth of an inch wide one are nil. They're nil. You're not going to hit it with a drilling program. You've got to have something a little more focused than that to find it. So I've always, got, I've always get surprised. I've got the hill out, and then, boop, there's the little spring. And there's always a structural reason for the spring. But aperture of the joints is key thing. So when you have these dense, non-aqueous phase liquids that go down through the joints and spread out from the site, they can be very, very tough to trace down unless you've got angled holes and you've got them angled in the right direction. So that's why I want to get that through to you. So rock mechanics is all about jointing. And it's all about the asymmetry of the jointing. And this is just all this takes is two Mark I eyeballs and some experience and look and look and look and look. So I, I usually learn more by going out and doing trenches and mapping the trenches than I do by boring. I don't, you don't do borings until you have a real good reason to do the boring and to do it in the direction you're going to do it. You've got to do a lot of work before you start doing borings because borings are a big waste of money in a lot of these cases. Okay, here I am in Hilldale, Utah. This is where all the uh, poly Mormon polygamists, one of their colonies is around there. And um, it's right near the Utah-Arizona line. And I'm looking at the Navajo sandstone here. And that's a joint face. That's a clean, beautiful joint face. The client, every rock climber loves to climb up and pretend you're at Yosemite or something. And here's another nice, clean joint face. Real nice and smooth. This is real unusual. In fact, this is the only time I saw this in all the American Southwest. There's this one face where it's that for some reason it's cutting across both joint sets so what I'm seeing here is thousands of joints on a 3,000 foot high escarpment that's 3,000 feet that's that's pretty awesome and the Navajo right here is 2,360 feet thick one unit 2,360 feet thick and what you're seeing here is is one set going this way and the other set going that way, and they're both intersecting out here on the face of the mountain. Now, when you got up there closer to this, I'm miles away from this right here. When I got up there close to it and mapped this thing, the spacings on the master joints were 85 to 125 feet. 85 was set A, and the 125 was set B, the less intense set. But you can see the scale here. 
I've never had joints that far apart, except I'm dealing with a unit that's 2,400 feet thick, and that's why they're that far apart. So those are big, huge, thick columns of rock. All right, so intensity of joints refers to how numerous they are, the spacings between them. Here I am uh, taking my young bride into the Grand Canyon. She's never been on whitewater rafting trip before. And uh, we're going up um, a tributary here called South Canyon. Yeah, and we're in Marble Canyon, about mile 15. And we're walking up this side canyon to the Colorado. And we're in the Esplanade Sandstone Unit. And this thing is just profusely exfoliated just like a granite. Now, when I first went back to Cal Poly and then to Bob Sharp at Caltech, and I said, I told him I had this, uh, you know, rampant exfoliation in sedimentary rock, all my professors didn't believe me. They said, no, you don't, you don't get exfoliation in sedimentary rock. Well, that's just because they hadn't seen it themselves. All rocks are subject, all massive rocks are subject to having all sorts of secondary jointing like this. It just depends on the rock fabric and uh, these spacings here are due to their response to the rapid excavation of this canyon. And so when you go in there and you rapidly excavate a very, very brittle rock that's been under tremendous load, uh, you will get lots of jointing. So here we are at Arches National Park. I went there to climb that same summer of 73, and here's where I got just totally blown away. I see this, this solid unit right here, and then where the arch is, I'm actually inside the arch looking to the side. Look at this profuse exfoliation. Just profuse. You know, every inch there's a joint. And then right there, it stops, just clear as a button, stops. And down here, it stops. So this bed is somehow different from this one and that one. So I showed these to Fred Donath at uh, University of Illinois, the Donath medals named after today. He was a great structural geologist, and he looked at that and he said, oh, those are extension fractures. That's induced tension. That has to do with the stiffness of the rock. You need to test full spectrum stress strain curves and look at stiffness and that's why I did. And you saw those pictures already. Turned out he was right. This was a stiff and brittle facies. This was mushy, less stiff, and the roof one less stiff. The one that was real brittle is the one that the arches form in because of the the rock fractures so easily on low strain threshold. Now you can also look at joint faces and see things like this, which we call plumostructure. They look like feathers. And this has to do with the joint starting right here, like a penny-shaped crack, and then spreading in induced tension to create the joint. And we know that joints also form by reflection fractures, because if we go out and look at Seaver Lake, Utah Lake, around the Great Salt Lake, Lake Bonneville, uh, that just was full. 11,000 years ago, we see the regional systematic joints going through those young Pleistocene sediments over in, uh, in Utah. And what you see is you get this plumo structure and these conchoids, and you actually get this, uh, the plumo structure is out on the edge. It's like a, like a feathery type stuff. And these conchoids are these round things here that look like that. Now, uh, the conchoids probably represent the physical extent of the fracture extension during the formation of the joint. Here's what they look like when you get out and see them uh, on the outcrop. So here's a face, and I got these, these striae here, and they've picked up a little calcite accumulation on them. Sometimes they're misinterpreted as slick insides, but these are accretions that are ascribable to groundwater percolating along the joint face. So the calcite striae often form parallel to the crossbed laminae or the direction of seepage. Now, when you also look at joints in the ground, here's an old joint coming through here that's been healed, and you see these mineralogical halos. And this one is kind of a, kind of a limey gray-green in the middle, and then it has these succeedingly lighter and lighter pink halos around where the joint was. That's because groundwater that percolated through here had dissolved cations in it, had, you know, had dissolved salts, and those reacted 
with the ground around us. So you get a mineralogical halo, and you can actually get a healed joint that has mineralization halos. And that's a big issue if you're dealing with something like a dam or a bridge foundation or something, where you have joints, but the joints are actually stronger than the country rock around them. Now here's what a conchoidal ridge looks like. That's the biggest one I've ever seen a picture of in my career. That's a conchoid ridge. That's a ranger that used to go out hiking with me on the weekends. And this conchoid ridge is about a meter amplitude. It's about 39 inches, a bump. And so this is a huge joint face in the Navajo sandstone in the high country, back country at Zion, where the people never get into. And um, this is a huge joint face, probably about as big as a football field. Very, very large. And so has the world's largest conchoids I've ever seen. Those are really big ones. Now here's what we were looking, you were just looking at. So you have the plumo structure coming up, and then the conchoid was going around like that. And as you get up here, you start getting these C fractures. So if we look on here, you have the main joint face, number one. Uh, number two are the joint fringes. So this is the joint fringe up here. And you have another one down here. Sometimes you can't see it. And then number three are the plumo structure. That's these things that look like feathers. And that's where this thing comes up and turns and goes off at an angle and stops. And you get the plumo structure up there on that. Four are fringe joints. The fringe joints are where it goes in at an angle, usually about 30 degrees. So this thing's straight here. And then as you get to the fringe, they get curvilinear and turn in. And then five C fractures. You can actually see that. These are called the C fractures, where these things come up like that. And then six are the shoulder of the joint which is this line, the demarcation here between where it's really flat and where you get it turning off at an angle, and then the trace of the main joint out here on the free face. And this is from uh, Hodgson's thesis, it was a petroleum geology thesis back in 1961. So other attributes of joints, when I'm walking around on top of the cliff face, I can actually see the matted joint face that used to be closed and this is opened up here, a couple inches wide, because this is relaxing toward the free face. Some of these I found at Zion were six feet wide. You could actually drive a Jeep into them, they're so big. But these are different kinds of, of joint terminations where you have one riding past another one. Now, when you get something like this, fluid's not going to be able to get through here as easily as it's going to be able to get through a cluster. So the joint clusters end up controlling where the fluid goes. So generally, you get a rock slide or a landslide, there's going to be some cluster feeding into it out here because you have more through-going transferability. This actually shows various things I sketched of joint terminations. Feathering termination, crossover, which is very, this is very common statistically. This kind of crossover, feathered crossover, is also common. Once in a while I'd see this, where one was growing this way, met one growing this way, and they turned away from each other. But that's pretty rare. That was pretty rare. Joint aperture is also affected by dilation. So joints are giant zero tension boundaries. So they can open up, they can dilate in response to changing loads. This is actually the opposing faces of a giant graben in um, Canyonlands National Park. Now, this is where I fell in love with geology. I, I bought a Jeep when I was 18 years old. I was a freshman in college. And I'd, I'd seen about this place, the Joint Trail, Chesler Park, uh, in um, a 1966 or 67 issue of... Um, of a National Geographic, and I wanted to go there and see it, and you had to have four-wheel drive to even get into Canyonlands National Park. Canyonlands National Park has three different districts that are hundreds of miles apart to get to because of the Green River and the Colorado River. So this is the Needles District, which is down in the south part that you get to from uh, Blanding, uh, Utah. And I got in here, and there's these huge grabbins. So these are these opposing sides here of this thing are like 25 feet apart. And it turns out, what they didn't know at that time, but this is due to was the uh, paradox salts underneath came up into upheaval, like an up, giant upheaval type of dome. The rivers solutioned all that salt out, and so you got these big grabbing structures 
that you can actually drive right down. They go for 20, 30 miles. It's just an incredible giant feature and this giant landslides that uh, slide down toward the river because that's where all the salt's being taken away by solutioning. Now years later I saw the same kind of structures in Iran in the Zagros Mountains near Reza Shah Kabir, which is now called Karun Dam. Same kinds of features from the mobilization of salts uh, from underlying formations being dissolved away and taken away. So these are opposing faces of a single joint in a graben. And that's a pretty extreme case right there. But you always want to look at both sides and say, you know, do these things, you know, do they match up? Can you put them together here and match them together? And this one's pretty obvious. Yeah, they, they do match together. Okay, I'm going to stop there this week. We'll try to finish up rock mechanics next week and we'll have more homework next week so try not to get too far behind on the homework if you do have to get behind on the homework send me a some sort of note or promissory note telling me when you'll promise to get it into me